Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host Titus and today I'm joined by my friend Pete Spiliakos to do shorter conversations about how movies reflect American society. To begin with, we'll talk about A Quiet Place, the horror movie now sitting atop the box office. With more than 100 million in grosses in America, and the unique story about parents having to face the fears of raising children. Hello Pete, this was your idea. First of all, what a wonderful idea to just do shorter things, chat about what's on our minds. So thanks for suggesting it and tell me, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I've seen a bunch of movies that I think I enjoyed. I know I enjoy Quiet Place, but I've seen a couple of movies that are enjoyable on one level, but also really flawed on another level. And usually if I really like a movie, I'll see it two or three times, whereas... Some movies lately that I've seen, I've they were enjoyable enough the first time around, but I had no real desire to see them again. Whereas with A Quiet Place, which is in some ways not a particularly pleasurable experience to watch, since it's a horror movie about pain and loss and terror, I'd be glad to see it again just on its artistic merits, really deep emotions that it managed to evoke in the viewer. And especially it's a movie made really from an adult's perspective, which a lot of horror movies really aren't. Most are built around adolescent anxieties, often about becoming adults, but they're ultimately from the adolescent perspective. And as an adult, you have to try to put yourself in the place of these adolescents. But this is a movie that's told almost entirely from the adult's perspective. Even when when stuff is happening to the kids, you're looking at it as an adult rather than as one of the children. Yep, that's a very good point and it's key to understanding the movie as we'll get to later. And it's also reflected in the success of the movie. This is a rarity among horrors. It's already past a hundred million dollars after two weekends. It was of course a very cheap movie to make and it recommends both the horror team behind it, the two writers and the director and star John Krasinski, who's finally showing something with a grasp on America. And the audience has responded. People have showed up about as many women as men and a lot of adults, all for a story about the most suburban of suburban families in a rural area that's beautiful green America and also a place of horror it turns out. Nobody has made this movie before. Well, not only has no one really made this movie before, no one has really dealt with these themes in this way before that I've ever seen. We were one of the few critics who pointed out that this movie is about helicopter parenting. Whereas Sonny Bunch thought it was a pro-life movie, and I think Sonny Bunch is partly correct, and that moron from The New Yorker basically said that it was something about white supremacy or what have you. This is not about rural survivalism. This is about the anxieties that parents have if something should really go wrong with their children. And the thing about helicopter parenting is that it's never described in American popular culture other than to be mocked. It's never portrayed except to be satirized. Whereas this is the first movie that takes those anxieties seriously. It's not necessarily endorsing them, but it looks at those fears that produce this kind of parenting. And it says, yeah, that's based on something that that terror is real. That terror is human. And this really influences how people act. And maybe they shouldn't act that way, but we should take those fears of loss and responsibility seriously. And that's where the real terror is, is that you identify with these parents with this feeling that if the slightest thing goes wrong, they lose their kids. That's ultimately the emotional basis of helicopter parenting. And this is the first time, I think, in art that our society has actually said, okay, this is what these people are feeling. They're not just silly, stupid people who are driving their kids two or three city blocks. Because on one level, it is silly. By every statistical measure, society is much safer now than it was when I was a kid. You're much less likely to be shot, much less likely to be kidnapped, much less likely to be raped. All of these things are less likely to happen, and yet among the American upper middle class, they clamp down on their kids a lot more. This movie kind of helped me understand the parenting styles that I see within the American upper middle class, because I came up in the American immigrant working class, Gen X. Helicopter parenting and taking your kids everywhere and supervising them constantly is a little much for me on one level. But I, after this movie, I'm like, okay, I understand the feelings that are driving this a little better than I did before. Yeah, so this really is the perfect time for this movie because we're crazy at some level to be so afraid. We are statistically very safe, but on the other hand, we really are just more aware of how precious children are, how strange accidents can just pull you out of your peaceful anonymity and ruin your life suddenly. It's very unlikely to happen, but it shows how fragile human beings are and how we are exposed in our love. What a vulnerable thing it is to be a parent. And it's strange that this movie isn't made 
but maybe as a society we're not willing to deal with these things and it's understandable that we don't but we should and these writers the director they have done a public service in this way just like you reacted to it I also thought i've gone around america looking at people i've seen this and they didn't see it when they were doing it and maybe art can help people to understand themselves and to understand each other better Putting a suburban family in such a rural area is supposed to show there's a reason we all ran out of the cities if we could afford to. We want this kind of control because we're afraid of what we're doing to ourselves as a society and how aware we become on the news and just in our conversations of what bad things might befall us that we're not really in control. Just as a movie you would think you're a movie critic you have a kind of duty to look at it as a story. It begins with a situation in a city and it leads to catastrophe and then over a bridge you run away into suburbia and rural America. How are these symbols not obvious? I do not know, but there they are. Yeah, and also I think that it being rural also tends to isolate and dramatize the situation because one of the fears of the movie is literally anything can get you. It could be the pool that they drown in. It could be the stuff that's under the cabinet at your house that they drink. And one of the things I thought the movie really dealt with, I don't even know how intentional it is. There's a religious aspect to the terror because the parents aren't just terrified of losing their kids. It's also a movie about the terror of self-recrimination, where if anything goes wrong and anything happens, it's your fault. But that's also guilt without the possibility of forgiveness. The post-religious element means that there's no escape if something really bad happens. There's no getting it off your conscience. And that makes the possibility of loss that much worse because the world isn't just unforgiving in the sense that any mistake could lead to death. It's also unforgiven in the sense that the characters are completely incapable of forgiving themselves because they have no framework for forgiveness. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's the most adult part of the adult drama, how the mother and the father deal with their loss and with the terrible burden now put on them. Their kids were small and they're growing up, but they lost a child and this weighs on their souls in a way that will never go away. These are healthy Americans and they did the natural thing. They're trying to have another child. That's life affirming the goodness of being human, even in the face of such a catastrophe. And you get the sense of this might be providential or this might be climactic in a horror sense early on in the movie before all of the surprises and all this stuff. But you're right, in the beginning again you see there's way more equality between parents and children. Between the desires of the children and the willingness of the parents to let them be free in some ways. The result is a catastrophe and that installs this tyranny of safety. The parents need to make sure that if God is not watching your kids, you should be every moment of every day. And the thriller does actually a great job of setting up the story without spoiling any surprises. You see what surveillance living is like. Which steps in the house are you allowed to step on? What sort of things are you allowed to do and what sort of things not so that you don't draw attention to yourself? This is remarkably apposite about an aspect of American life that we don't see. We tend to talk about American life in terms of your avenues for self-expression and how you create identities for yourselves and give meanings and publicize them. Here it's the opposite. It's the fear of attracting attention. Well, it's not just that, but it's also how narrow the path is to survival and upward mobility. Exactly. Because the terror isn't just of death. The terrors of failure and the failure could be your kid dying early it's more likely to be your kid getting a heroin addiction or your kid getting a criminal record and not being able to go to a good college so if you put a foot wrong it could be a social disaster i think the film especially focuses on the anxieties of the upper middle class but i think it's accessible to other people who would like to parent that way but simply don't have the time and other family resources you come from a wage earner family with single family disrupted families you can't supervise your kids out there which means means that they're doing things you might not want them to do. And there's also no way around it because you don't get to make your own hours and you can't afford a babysitter. So I think those anxieties are much more accessible to people outside the American upper middle class. But it's not just the terror of death. It's also the terror of downward mobility, what Chris Rock called keeping your daughter off the pole, where they have markers for exactly where you should step on the stairs is symbolic of the narrow path that a lot of people feel like you have to walk if you and your kids are going to stay in the American upper middle class. 
Yes, and of course you're right that this is also tied up with mobility and anxieties about the future because that's again stuff you cannot control about your child and the discipline you have to impose on a child that just doesn't understand it. Children grow up in America as a kind of freedom where you can want things and get things and do things, but their parents live in an America where you have to be really worried about political crisis, economic crisis, social changes, and all sorts of things that affect your life directly in ways you were not aware were possible because we thought we had offloaded our existential problems. There were going to be systems that deal with things, education, healthcare, all sorts of things, but these have become massively problematic and come to the core of our political crisis. It would be crazy not to think that just like healthcare is an ongoing shock for so many people in their immediate private lives, so also education as college debt and all sorts of other things come crashing is going to be just as urgent and the movie does a good job of dramatizing these emotions, showing you that parents have to live with certain burdens about an unpredictable future, an invisible something out there that could at any point go wrong. You don't know why, and you don't know that there's any reprieve. And that's an experience now for so many tens of millions of people. I agree, and I also think that the movie is really good about talking about how precarious a lot of people's lives feel. And in the form of these aliens that are incomprehensible and usually invisible, and when they come for you, they're also invincible. Dramatizes those feelings of anything could go wrong at any time unless you do things exactly right. But in America, downward mobility is another possible disaster because it doesn't just mean you live in a smaller house. Downward mobility also means that your kids are much more likely to be divorced or never married themselves. It means it's much more likely that your kids are going to have an addiction. It means that your kids are much more likely to commit suicide. And this bifurcation in America when it comes to social capital, it doesn't necessarily express itself in everyday life, but people can feel it even if they can't articulate it and they damn sure act on it. So this movie actually just symbolizes those anxieties of how any mistake could lead to social disaster, if not necessarily for you, because adults are relatively resilient. It could lead to a disaster for your kid that a mistake that they can't see coming and God forbid that you can't see coming will actually be a disaster for them and you'll be stuck because in this movie the parents are it's what a year and a half after the kid died and they feel bad the anxiety is that you know you'll be in your 50s and you'll feel bad because your kid died of a drug overdose I mean, what step could you have painted on the stairs so that they wouldn't have made the stairs creak so that this disaster would not have come for them and on that level I think the movie is powerful at dramatizing those feelings that really aren't described in American art and once again, if they are described, they're usually just mocked. Oh, the free-range kids, go out, they'll be great. I, You know, when I was a kid, we used to go around and we used to do the thing. Yeah, yeah, you did, and so did I. But the people who have those worries have reasons for having those worries. And there's a lot of American 21st century free-range kids who are having quite a few problems. And people see that they're having quite a few problems. So maybe there's a reason. That doesn't make it right. That doesn't mean people should parent this way. But understanding starts with taking those anxieties seriously and seeing where they're reasonable and where they're not reasonable, rather than just dismissing it and saying, your kid's going to be okay. Kids in the 1950s were, or the 60s tended to be okay. Well, yeah, you know what? Most of them did turn out to be okay, but a much larger fraction of them tended to end up dying in abandoned refrigerators when they crawled inside playing a hide and seek. So the fear is legit. The fear is perfectly human. Understanding starts with taking it seriously rather than just dismissing it or mocking it. Yeah, and this is a good example of Gen X art dealing with American anxieties and showing that American dignity has a lot to do with the problem of insecurity. It's not poverty primarily that humiliates and scares people, it's insecurity. It's the fact that they don't know where they stand in life and what the future brings for them. We should also say a lot of the people who have a sort of nostalgia for the way things were when they were kids, which is often justified and helpful in certain ways to give you an alternative, they would also tell you immediately, yeah, but when we were kids, we thought we'd get jobs. We thought there were things were going to work out. That has changed. People's outlook now is far more insecure and it starts far earlier. And these kinds of social worries they're almost tailor-made for the horror movies. We're not willing to talk about it in the press most of the time. We do not have TV to talk about it. Digital has no way to address except to make people addicts of digital. So it's almost a perfect social situation for horror to emerge because it's something people aren't willing to face and it runs their lives in mysterious ways. Now, finally, we have this and people can watch the movie and think about it and talk about it and see, yeah, 
parents are in a really messed up situation. We should see that's what's happening to them and they're not in a position where you can tell them we'll just get a grip, say be more virtuous or have more government agencies. None of this is going to by itself solve or in combination solve the anxieties people live with because this is where they really live. This is what America is experienced as by a lot of people. It shouldn't be dismissed and you're right. The first thing, take it seriously. Show some respect to these people. Their dignity is involved in their agony. The great line in the movie is the mother saying, if we can't protect them, then who are we? The very identities of uh, so many people are invested as they should be in their children. They deserve respect. They deserve understanding. There is that. It's a great line, and it's actually a great horror movie. It's going to endure as a classic. But I think understanding rather than dismissing can be a first step towards moderation. Because I think that in real life, people's anxieties often take unreasonable turns. And the movie dramatizes this by having literally where your foot's supposed to go outlined so that the boards won't creak. I think if people don't have a language for dealing with it, instead of dealing with the problem, they deal with their anxieties, which is something that's different. Their anxieties are not necessarily the real problems. And I think that people do have problems saying, listen, I'm afraid that anything that goes wrong, something's going to go terribly for my kids. So what I do is I micromanage because even if I don't necessarily deal with the problem, it feels like I deal with the problem. And at least the anxiety is lessened for a little while. I think that understanding where these anxieties come from might actually allow people to be more moderate in how they deal with them. In other words, having names for these fears, having an understanding and respect for these fears because they're not completely illusions, it allows people to say, okay, you know what? This is just me being anxious. This is not me dealing with the problem. This is not me being logical. This is me managing my anxiety. Whereas if you dismiss the problem, you say, hey, everything's fine, just leave the kids alone, they'll be fine. And then they look at numbers about increasing alcohol abuse or increasing heroin abuse, and they go, wait a minute, these people are full of crap. Because the people who are telling you, leave, just leave it alone, everything's going to be fine, they're full of crap. Because everything's not going to be fine. There's a lot of people out there for whom it's not fine. You can do better or worse things to deal with it. That's probably more logical rather than just dismissing them, because if you dismiss them, they're going to dismiss you, as they should. Because even if they're doing something wrong, telling them they don't have to do anything, that's going to be rejected as it should. Yep, you're right about this. It should be stressed that there's more community to be found at the movies, a sense of this is part of who we are, and if we address it, we could deal with it. We could be less obsessed, with less crazy, if we realize that these are problems we have to deal with. And even if we don't have the solutions yet, we can take a good look at ourselves and see we've gone too far in a very specific direction for understandable reasons, but we have got to gradually stop try and deal more with this except that you can't see where the problem is coming from you can't take control of it and the systems that were supposed to protect us socially they're not working so well now but the reality of statistics shouldn't be making you personally crazy it should be making you cautious in certain ways but you've got to get a grip to see that that's what it is that there is an invisible thing that is nevertheless real that affects real people's lives it's a smart idea to be worried about it and a little fearful. Just don't go crazy. Strange as it is, there's a moral education for moderation in a horror movie. Actually, to a large extent, isn't that what horror movies really do at their best? They teach people that their fears are based on something real, but are also either they're manageable or they have to be stoically endured. That's one of the themes of horror movies. Either they have to be adjusted to, managed, or they have to be endured. And one of the lessons of Quiet Place is that it has to be both managed and endured. It has to be reasonable. Their responses have to be thoughtful and proportional. Now, the movie is a little too serious to even say that there's a satirical edge to it. There's a dramatization of these anxieties, but I don't think the movie ever does much to mock their anxieties. It never devolves into black comedy. And I also am conflicted about Sonny Bunch's implication that it's a pro-life movie. Yeah, it is. I also think this is one of the few recent pieces of art that portray pregnancy and labor as being a heroic activity in the way that the ancients understood it to be a heroic activity, whereas her giving birth is in its own way much more dramatic, much more admirable, much more emotionally powerful than almost anything you'll see in a superhero movie or a war movie. It's an incredibly touching scene because you really feel the courage and the love that it takes in order to do this. And you'll see pieces of art from ancient Greece talking about it. 
in Sparta, there were only two kinds of public monuments allowed, for soldiers who died in battle and for women who died in childbirth. And I do think the movie actually is very powerful in how it portrays pregnancy and labor as being a real epic, heroic activity that is really only approached in its admirableness by the most extreme of male activities. But at the same time, the ancients weren't exactly pro-life. They valued childbirth, but they didn't necessarily value the child that was born. Now, these guys obviously did. But it's also worth thinking that admiring labor and pregnancy is not exactly the same thing as being pro-life as 21st century Americans consider pro-life, either in the narrow political sense or in the broader culture of life sense. Yeah, you're right that there is only a cultural sense of pro-life, which is very important because it's so much of American identity. Americans want life to be good and believe in the goodness of life at the same time. And there's a broad understanding that people would want more children than they have. And people believe that a culture that orients itself to a large extent around children is a way of believing in providence, that there is a good future ahead of us. And that is an important part of the movie, but it also brings, as you said, a tragic sensibility from the ancient ancient times that's also very good fit for horror. The life you bring your children into really does provide place for all the things that scare us. There really are a lot of terrors, there really is a lot of evil in this world, and we shouldn't be neglecting it. We shouldn't be thinking about life as just a good thing you enter into. It is a momentous thing. It is in some sense a gift, but it also comes with terror, and it robs mothers of some of their dignity not to see this. It's one of the few great things at the top of human experience, and that's because they have the character of the fullness of human experience, the great good things and the great terrible things together. And you get the horror and you get the blood and you get the pain because giving life is not an aesthetically pleasing, safe, neutral experience. It's the opposite of that. Well, we also have the medicalization of pregnancy and labor, so I think we've lost a lot of the drama, which doesn't make it less important, but I think on one level, it doesn't feel like as much as it was when you're much more likely to die in childbirth. Now, one of the earlier scenes in the movie is she is taking her own blood pressure. She no longer has the entire supportive structure of the healthcare system. She has to take care of herself. But the movie is getting at something really important and really human. When she's in the bathtub and she's stifling a scream as she's about to give birth, knowing that screaming will kill both her and the baby, in its own way, it's just as dramatic as the opening scene in Saving Private Ryan. You feel for her just as much as you feel for the soldiers who are being shot. It's the same level of human engagement. I felt that same pitch of anxiety, but also the sense that is, why would anyone go through this? How admirable is it that anyone would go through this? That they wouldn't simply find a way out. It's one of the few pieces of art I've seen recently that managed to get across, as you said, what an apex human experience this is. Yep. The movie treats the American love of nature with full moral seriousness like you would see in a Western, so that nature is also seen in its dangers, in its necessities, in its hardship, and this mother and father are all of a sudden exposed to the need for virtues and an endurance that are no longer part of the contemporary world. The movie suggests you need something to give you the mental and psychological strength that people used to have before. We have become in certain ways brittle. We lack a certain moral toughness. Maybe that's also tied up with why we do not appreciate enough as a culture, both the mother and the nurse there. And it's rare to find a woman giving birth shown for what it truly is. It's not something we're usually willing to see. And maybe that's part of why pro-life isn't such a serious thing or a pro-choice in American discussion. It doesn't really confront the experience for what it is and the reality of giving birth and being born for what they are. Maybe art will help with this too. Well, also, I think it gets across certain truths about parenting that are dramatized. Like, there are certain paths that they walk, and the dad makes sure to put down sand on certain of those paths because you're not going to kick up dirt or muffle the sound of their feet. But it's a dramatization of things that a lot of parents really do. I remember I was taking my kid to a soccer game years ago, and I was listening to some of the parents talk, hey, I'll take this kid to that kid, I'll take the kid to that. One of the parents is just talking about all the different places that they take their kid and how every part of the day is scheduled. And I'm thinking to myself, who the hell wants to live like that? They sounded like a crazy person to me. 
But at the same time, when we see John Krasinski laying down sand along every path, when you see him micromanaging everything, it actually is a dramatization of a real parenting style. Now, they're not laying sand along the street, but they're trying to make every path that their kid might walk as safe as possible. But it's also an incredible time suck. And it's powered by a never-ending, never-ceasing anxiety. And that could also be one of the reasons why we're having declining birth rates, because not everybody wants to do that. Somebody looks at it and goes, wait a minute, we have two parenting styles. One is a parenting style where you have to give over virtually every minute of every day to parenting, and you have to try to anticipate every potential danger. Or you have another parenting style, which is kind of catch as catch can. You were with your kid when you can. Your kid's on their own whenever they have to be. And they're much more likely to be downwardly mobile. They're much more like something bad's going to happen to them. And a lot of people think, you know what? In this absence of moderation, maybe having kids isn't for me. I can't stand either path. Megan McArdle used to write that one of the good things about having gender segregation in work, now she's exaggerating how gender segregated work was. A lot more women were working full time than she's remembering. But what that meant was that there was a lot of pairs of eyes out there so that even if you couldn't watch your kid, somebody else was watching your kid. Two houses down, three houses down, four houses down. Since you don't know your neighbors as well, that's not as much the case anymore. Suburban development tends to be less social, and urban development, you tend to have more destructive families. You don't know who's around at a given hour necessarily. This puts the parents in the choice of having either hyper-surveillance environments for their kids or just taking their chances, knowing that they're going to be all together unsupervised a lot of the time. And a lot of people are like, you know what, I'd rather not make either choice. You're right, there's not a lot of community help, and people do feel like they're staring into the dark danger, and that emotion which comes with this sort of social problem that we describe with communities that don't work for the sake of children, which is a real part of our freedom. It has a lot of good things, economic freedom, freedom of movement, etc., but it comes at a certain cost, and that is that our communities cannot protect our children and earn our trust and get our investment in them, and that's dramatized as a fear of surroundings very very well the movie is just great at showing that suburbia really means you're much more isolated than you would admit that too is worth considering it's just as we talk about this movie more and more aspects show up that you can think of yep i've seen this happen i've seen people really do this they're no more aware of what they're doing than the horror characters are aware that they're play acting real life but both are very real also, the family has these two kids, one of whom is more reasonable because he's a child, the other one more unreasonable because she's an adolescent. You also see that the adolescent wants some kind of American freedom, run back to the city, cross that bridge and go back into the real world, whereas the other child, the father is forcing him into seeing the dangers of the world and trying to face up to fears, but the parenting style has already crippled the child emotionally in some ways. And again, I have seen this walking the streets of America. It's a real thing in our world that we push children into a kind of rebellion, they run away, and we also cripple them emotionally sometimes by scaring them so much, by putting so much safety consciousness in them. Yeah, and there are the two older children. The deaf girl obviously rebels. She feels this control as being ultimately counterproductive, whereas the younger kid feels the control as being protecting. But at the same time, he's in his cocoon, he's in all the more danger because he won't be able to manage the problems of the world. And neither of these are ideal ways of dealing with this situation of parental hyper-control. But at the same time, given the way that their parents are acting with their anxieties, it's not clear that there is a moderate way. Since the situation is extreme, there's not necessarily an obvious moderate answer. You have to start with moderation and understanding the dangers of life, understanding what's more likely to happen or less likely to happen, and being willing to accept a certain modicum of risk intelligently rather than blindly. But the kids aren't able to come to a reasonable understanding of how to transition into adulthood because the parents, which is to say us, or the American upper middle class, has an unreasonable understanding. Yep. And the but, children do also show these extremes of immoderation. The girl's deafness, while being a true account of the need and the desire and the American humanity of providing for people who don't have all the faculties most of us have, is also a symbol for what it means to be a teenager who just doesn't understand there's danger in the world. She's heedless of any bad things and that makes her irresponsible. On the other hand, the younger kid, who is more reasonable, is also hyper-aware of danger and it paralyzes him in action, which creates another kind of irresponsibility. And you're right, both the results of their parents' overbearing attitudes. 
that's where it's got to start with adults who are more serious about human beings and dangers and being intelligent about them as opposed to being dominated by them while lying that that's even happening and once again i think another thing the movie dramatizes most people can't really even people who feel this way even people who act this way in a less extreme way don't actually have language for for what they're feeling and certainly don't have any socially acceptable mode of expressing so either those feelings are bottled up and you say that everything's fine even when it's not or it expresses itself in hysterias where some event or something becomes a scapegoat and you deal with a scapegoat rather than dealing with the underlying anxieties and the underlying strategic problems with this parenting style because you don't have words for it. There's, you can blame a daycare provider. You can blame an AR-15. But these things aren't probably what's going to hurt your kid. At the end of the day, even if you should somehow deal with this, you're going to go back to your old behaviors the next day because the sources of anxiety will still be there because you've ultimately picked some not necessarily effective ways of dealing with the anxiety. In the beginning, is saying, all right, what's scaring me? How do I deal with this? What's the way of dealing with it that allows them to become functional adults? Not a teenager who courts danger for the sake of courting danger and not somebody who will reject the possibility of adulthood or even adolescence because they feel safe as a child. Yes, this is really what the movies should do. This is why we're doing this series. There are movies made every year that throw a revealing light on phenomena in our society. And John Krasinski is not John Ford. This is not going to be a great movie a hundred years from now. But it will always be an important document about the self-understanding of American parenting and the middle class aspirations for safety and for success and some degree of control over your own life and that of your children. This is part of the job of criticism, I would think, showing that these movies really are about our society and things that we are not otherwise willing to address and as you say they do make it public and they give you images and they give you a language to talk about these things so that we can be a bit more reasonable a bit more conversational and a bit less crazy especially since we feel these things anyway as i was watching the movie i thought about a much inferior movie jeepers creepers now nobody wants to talk to that movie because the director i'm a scumbag but the movie does have some points. The central theme of the movie is what makes a person transition from adolescent into successful adult life versus a person who fails. Everybody thinks about the monster, but the movie's really a way of dramatizing. You have these two siblings, one of whom is adult and put together, and the other one falls apart at any particular challenge. And the movie basically dramatizes the future course of their lives, where one of them lives and one of them dies. We all have those feelings. Am I going to be this one person? Am I going to be this other person? What separates one person from another person? How does fate play out? How does character play out in the course of somebody's lives? And having the language, what these movies do is they give us another way of thinking about these sorts of problems. Uh, horror is often dismissed as a junk genre, where it's often the most human. It takes things that we have difficulty talking about and it isolates them and it dramatizes them. And it gives us a language for talking them out in a way that feels safer rather than just throwing it out there and introducing it into a conversation ourselves. And everyone going, I don't have those feelings. No, I don't have them. No, 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 not me. That's just you. No, these movies succeed because millions of people have those feelings. And by making people feel like they're not alone, it allows them to talk about it. Yes, exactly. That's where you go to talk about society's problems that we don't want to acknowledge. And it's because they're so personal and we don't want to expose ourselves, really. We don't really feel free, much less encouraged, much less able to address these things in a useful and a plausible way. This is our last resort, but in a sense, it's also become our first resort. You want to see what's going on in America? Look at what scares the daylights out of people at the horror movies. It will be revealing. It's a window onto the world. Well... Pete, this is a great inaugural for this series, and let's do more of this, the themes and the worries and the society, in the way it appears at the movies. It's a great idea, so thanks again. Sounds great. I'll talk to you soon, Titus. Thanks for listening, folks, and if you enjoyed it, please subscribe and share our podcasts. You can find us on iTunes as American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast, on Twitter as Titus Film, and you can always drop a comment on social media. Until next time.